When someone closes a door in your face, all you have to remember is when God allows them to close the door in your face, all God wants you to do is walk up the hall. It's some more doors. You just got to walk up the hall because I can promise you he got a better door that he wants you to go through than the one that got shut in your face. That's a fact. But what happened to people is they stand there beating on the door. Open it back up. We're going to do a write-in campaign. Why are you leaving? I got to have my job. What about my benefits? Hey, stop. The door is closed for a reason. What are the five reasons that you won't give up when life catch you on the blind side? When the messenger of misery visits you, what are you going to do? What will keep you in the game? When life knocks you to the canvas. Life's going to punch you right in the face. Life's going to fire you over and over again. You're going to be told you're not good enough. Your faith is going to be tested. Your family's going to look you in the eye and say, how do we get health insurance the next month? I don't know, but I know we're going to make it. You know who's going to bail you out? You know who's going to come and rescue you? You know who's going to come and save the day? No one. No one's going to come and do it for you. You're going to have to do it all yourself. See, the Buster Douglas that fought in the last fight was not the Buster Douglas that fought Mike Tyson. See, the Buster Douglas that got knocked down while fighting Mike Tyson had gotten out of an alcohol recovery center. His mother had died. His wife was ill with a terminal illness. He was considered a nothing, a bum. So when he got knocked down, Buster Douglas had a reason to get back up because he said, I'm dedicating this fight to the memory of my mama. Life is hard, man. That's what it's about. Life is a challenge. If you don't work as hard as you can, if you don't sacrifice everything, if you don't get rejected and keep coming back for more, if you don't get your loyalty tested and your faith tested, you don't love that thing if you bail out. So if you fought through all that, that's love. So you've got to have some reasons that when life knocks you down, and it's going to. Hello, it's going to knock you down. When people disappoint you, and that's going to happen. When they betray you, and that's going to happen. When they lie to you, and that's going to happen. When they say, oh, you can count on me, and they won't show up, and that's going to happen. When you want to throw in the towel and give up yourself, and that's going to happen. When life collapses on you and catch you on the blind side, what reason can you remember that you can call on, that you can reach on, that can make you get back up? Find that reason. Because when life had knocked me down, I said, Mike, I'm doing this because I want to make my mama proud of me. I'm doing this because I want my children to have a better life than what I have. I'm doing this because all my life I've been told I'd be a loser, that I wouldn't make it. I'm doing this to make them a lie. I believe like Frank Sinatra, he said the best revenge in life is massive success. I'm doing this so I can become massively successful. And with that kind of courage, with that kind of affirmation and reason to empower me, I got a saying that when life knocks you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. You don't have to be grim, but you do have to be serious. Hey, everybody hopes things will get better, but remember, the future does not get better by hope. It gets better by plan. And hope unaided by clear plans can finally become an illness. There's a Bible phrase that says, hope long delayed makes the heart sick. It's a sickness. I used to have the illness known as passive hope. It's bad. And there's one that is even worse, and that is called happy hope. That is really bad. The man is 50, and he's broke, and he's still smiling. That's bad. So get serious. Make plans. Put them on paper. My suggestion from experience. There's a phrase from the Bible that goes, without dreams and vision, we perish. How true. Humans have this unique ability to aspire, to dream, to go for something, to become something. Without that, life is not life. We must have dreams and never give up on our dreams. I'd like to share a few ways your use of time are affected by or influence the achievement of your goals. Have you ever thought that without some very clear written goals, you never even need to consider managing your time? 
time essentials come from objectives well defined. Time can't be critical if objectives aren't defined. Now you might be one of those uniquely fortunate individuals who can keep all their objectives and purposes clearly defined in their minds and operate from that. But I wouldn't take the chance. Write your goals down and set careful priorities. Sometimes priorities are determined by the season. For a farmer in springtime, the season dictates his most important activities. During the spring, a farmer must work around the clock, burn the midnight oil, and keep the equipment running because he has only this small window of time for the planting of his crops. One of the difficulties of living in an industrialized society is the losing of the sense of seasons, when to pour it on, when to ease back, when to take advantage. It's easy to keep going from nine to five, year in and year out, and lose a natural sense of priorities and appropriate time. Don't let one year just blend into the next. Keep an eye on your own seasons, lest you lose track of values and substance. Part of setting priorities is learning to separate major activities from minor activities. This is a whole skill in itself, but once you have learned it, it will pay dividends you won't believe. So learn to put everything on your mental scales to be carefully weighed before you spend time or money. Of your sanity is socially distributed. And what I mean by that is, well, let's say that you know how to, I said already in this conversation, if you didn't learn to play with others between the time you were two and four, you will never learn. And psychologists have beat their heads against the wall trying to rehabilitate antisocial children. They can't do it after the age of four. Is that no, because areas of the brain just don't develop? Well, it seems to be partly because the kids fall farther and farther behind. So let's say you make the leap from egocentric dependence on your mother at two and three to immersion in a peer group. Well, then, the, then you, you pick peers that are at your same developmental level and you chase each other up the developmental ladder. And the longer you're out of that, the farther you fall behind. And so, you know, kids, five-year-old kids might come across another five-year-old kid who tends to cry too much if they don't get their way. And they'll say, we don't want to play with the baby. And what they're saying is, we have to find someone who's at our developmental level, shares our developmental horizon so that we can mutually scaffold our further development. Now, they're not going to say that, obviously, but that's the situation. And kids test each other out when they first meet. So do adults. Game, 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 game. Can you play? Are you playing at the same level as me? If you're acceptable to your peers and you behave well, they'll accept you. And then they tell you all the time if you're acting appropriately, you know, if your jokes are funny, if you're dominating the conversation, if you're bringing something of value to the table, and all you have to do is pay attention to the social cues and you'll keep yourself regulated. And at the end of the day, you're gonna get what you focus on. They're both true. This is both the most amazing time that's ever happened ever in recorded history. And yet real things that are terrifying are also happening. But where you put your energy, where you put your attention, where you put your focus is going to determine what you see. And that is the most fascinating and the most important thing you have to understand about the way that your mind works. You get what you focus on. If you focus on the things that are bad, they will become real. They will become exaggerated. They will begin to monopolize your thoughts. You'll see them everywhere. It's called the reticular activating system. Your mind is literally designed to pay attention to the things that you notice. Once you notice a certain car, you see it everywhere. Once you notice a certain dog, you see it everywhere. Once you hear a certain name for the first time, suddenly you realize that that name has been all around you this entire time. But now that you're focusing on it, now that you're looking for it, it is everywhere. So whatever you look for, it's gonna be everywhere. If you look for the negative, it'll be there. But if you look for the positive, it will overwhelm you. When you manage something, you do so to keep it going. Well, you don't need to keep time going. You don't even need to watch it. You can be completely aware, well, unaware of it. You can go to sleep, doesn't matter. Time just continually moves. Doesn't need you, it doesn't need me. It just keeps moving. 
We don't need to do time management because there's nothing to manage. It's automatic. It continually moves. What we need to do is priority management. With the time that is continually slipping away from us, we need to manage our priorities to maximize the time we have. So don't manage your time, maximize your time. How? By doing the things that are the most important to do at that moment. Make every day your masterpiece.